Chapter 4 From Sperm to Worm So the first thing that you need to know is what developmental psychology is all about and that's what chapter 4 is. Developmental psychology is that a study of how and why people change and remain the same over time. Yep, they do both, change and remain the same. We're going to look at it psychologically, cognitively, and socioculturally as well over the whole lifespan. Now, there are issues in a developmental psychology that we're going to go over. The three main issues have to do with nature versus nurture, change and stability or the ability to stay the same, continuity, which means it's continuous over time, or stages. What you need to know is nature, which is genetics, goes with stages and goes with change. Nurture goes with stability and goes with continuity. So when we look at nature and nurture and the differences between the two, we know that a lot of our childhood is driven by genetic processes. And because they're both combined, come brings in the nurture aspect of how we interact with our society, with people around us, with media, with everything that comes anywhere near us. One thing that we have learned is that there are more differences in a group than between groups. So let's look at gender, for example. There are more differences between women themselves than when we look at women as a whole and men as a whole and compare those two groups. Again, men have more differences between them than there are between men as a whole compared to women as a whole. And we find that the same with racial, ethnic groups, cultural groups, etc. We find that there are more differences within the group themselves than between the groups. We've discussed this before, that you have 23 pair of chromosomes from Ma, 23 from Pa, makes you 46 total. Now when we look at this, the very last chromosome comes into play, and that's either an X chromosome, XX, or an XY. If you look at this, you'll see that the very last chromosome is an X chromosome, and it looks as if there are two long Xs there. And so that, of course, is female. When we look at XY chromosomes, there are a few th issues that are going to come up. Here's a picture of an X chromosome and a Y chromosome. You can see the Y chromosome is much smaller than the X. So there are very, there's quite a few genetic disorders that are X linked or X carried. Now, if an X and an X are together, you have to have both of the issues on both of those chromosomes in order for that female to have it or have the problem. So let's say um, one has a learning disability in writing on the X chromosome, one has a learning disability in math on the other chromosome, because there's both chromosomes there, X chromosomes that can cover each other, that means that female will have neither one of them. It would have to have both X's carry the exact same issue in order for that female to have that issue. That's why you see in special education classrooms with ADD and all sorts of different things, there are more men than there are women because that X chromosome can cancel it out. On the other hand, with that little Y, notice how small that Y is. It's an upside down Y if you look at it. That Y does not have just the mass to cover up the issues that there are. So if an issue is on the X chromosome, the Y will not be able to counteract it and therefore the child will have it. So if that X has a learning disability in writing, that Y can't contradict that. So the child, the boy child, will have the X chromosome in writing and therefore have that disability. Color blindness is another one that is really well known for this X and Y combination. So. Uh, there are less females that are colorblind than males because both X's would have to carry the exact same version of colorblindness for that child to have colorblindness. Whereas, if the X is carrying it with a Y unable to contradict it, that child will be colorblind. 
All right, when we look at continuity versus stages and nurture and nature, the main thing you need to know is nurture is continuous, like I stated at the beginning. Nature is stages. The other thing that you need to know is nurture is environmental and nature is genetics. We're going to look at different stage theorists and continuity theorists. Three big stage theorists that we'll discuss will be Goldberg, Erickson, and Piaget. They will look at cognitive development, moral development, and psychosocial development, and how they parallel with each other over time. One thing you need to know as well is that your personality, your temperament is more genetically set than your personality, which can have some alterations based on culture to it. We essentially say personality is genetic, but it's truly your temperament that's genetic. Um, they just tend to go interchangeably because that genetics is uh, more difficult to change over time. So another thing that we have are traits as well. Those are your coping strategies, your work habits, all of those kind of things, is especially your attitude, that belong in that stability and change. There is a time period we have to exclude, and that's the teenage years. During your teenage years, you could be just hell on wheels, the most rebellious person that there is, unhappy, ticked off, the whole thing, and you can still become a well-adjusted, happy adult. And we've seen it many, many times. Because of the hormonal changes that take place and so many physical, emotional, uh, psychological changes that take place during those teenage years, we exclude that time period uh, in understanding our temperaments and our personalities overall. When we start from sperm to worm, the first thing that we have to look at prior to even being born is the danger of teratogens. Teratogens, we call monster makers because they are any substance, anything that happens out there that can damage the embryo or the fetus. Now that's everything, everything in the world can do it. It can be um, things that are in paint for when you're painting the room. Stress is a huge teratogen. Um, alcohol, of, of course, is one of the most well-known teratogens out there that causes fetal alcohol syndrome. And that causes brain abnormalities, cognitive thinking issues, behavioral problems. Uh, the more exposure there is during those fetal stages, the more issue. Now, the other thing that you need to know is that there is more damage caused from fetal alcohol syndrome during the fetal period than there are prior to that. So we have documented issues of fetal alcohol syndrome occurring upon conception. So we have a zygote that actually has fetal alcohol syndrome. So that we have to understand that 80% of all pregnancies are all created when both mother and father have been not only drinking alcohol but are considered drunk. When a child first starts out after being born, reflexes are really what runs their world and helps them to learn. So there's a few uh, inborn reflexes that happen right off the bat. The first three, uh, one, rooting reflex. The rooting reflex is when you touch a child's cheek, you can run your finger across their cheek, and you'll find that they will turn and open their mouth. That's called the rooting reflex. When they open their mouth and start suckling on whatever it is that you rubbed against their cheek, then that's the sucking reflex. Crying when hungry, crying when hurt, all of those are reflexive. Two more newborn reflexes have to do with stepping and grasping. Now fathers in particular tend to like these a great deal. If you put an infant so that both feet touch a surface, you'll find that they will automatically lift one foot. If you continue that and even sort of move them, you'll notice that they lift the other foot and they go back and forth as if they're ready to walk. Of course they're not. This is just a reflex. And the thought process right now is still continues to be that it is just sort of uh, practice for the future kind of thing. No, they can't walk. 
the grasping one we always get parents that think their children are of a superhuman strength and they're going to be the next you know wrestler football player that kind of thing grasping is a reflex because we as parents sort of suck um, the grasping reflex is for them to be able to grasp onto your hair, your shirt, your necklace, whatever, so that when you accidentally go to grab that coffee pot that's fallen off of the counter and forget you're holding your child, that child can hold for just enough time to make sure that they don't fall and get harmed in the meantime. That grasping reflex is pretty intense. If you put your finger inside their palm, they will automatically grasp and you can actually lift them up. And for some, you can even sort of swing them back and forth from just being able to grasp on. It has nothing to do with muscles. It has nothing to do with muscle uh, density or anything else. It's completely reflexive. Another inborn ability or reflex is the ability to look at a face and recognize that it's a face. Now the whole reason why that's reflexive is a face will be the thing that will take care of you. So you will notice that within an hour after being born a child can look at a face. Now you flip that face upside down, you distort it in some way and they will look away. So it's a face that they know will care for them. So a face is something that they will look at twice as long as anything else. Now again, when we look at that temperament, you're born with a predisposition to behave, react to your surroundings in a certain manner. So when we look at temperaments, we have a range. Again, just like almost everything we have in psychology. There's the easy babies to the difficult and the medium ones somewhere in between there that are called the slow to warm ups. So if and when you have a baby, you will be asked, oh, is it an easy baby? What they mean by that, or a good baby, what they mean by that is um, how does it react to others? Does it get frustrated easily? Does it start crying long before it's time for their bottle? Or is it a child that, you know, even though you're late with the feeding, they're really just fine. They don't react negatively. They're not crying on a regular basis. They don't get upset easily. Those are easy to difficult with slow to warm ups in the center which also leads us to another term that goes along with it and the way they react. Are they highly reactive or are they low reactive? Low reactive tend to be easy babies. High reactive tend to be difficult babies. And of course, it's on a range where there's the middle somewhere in between there. Now, for many children, um, they will be born and they are difficult, highly reactive babies. So these babies are the ones that cry all the time. Uh, parents will joke around as they get older and say, oh yeah, we had to drive you every night all over the world and back uh, just to get you to calm down. I had to run the vacuum for you. I had to put you on the washer and just shake you on, in your car seat, that kind of thing. All of those things were ways to calm you because you could not be calmed yourself you could not be calmed by normal, typical things that would calm other children or other infants. So you were more difficult and highly reactive. You get pissed off as a baby easier. And so you tend to, by the way, remain that way when you get older. Easy behaviors tend to become easy, laid back uh, adults. Difficult babies tend to remain difficult as adults. We, we tend to say that they are high maintenance individuals. Now the funny thing is, is well, when I discuss this, I usually get a few upset students because they, they recognize that they were a difficult baby. They recognize the humor and all the discussions that have happened about it. And they're like, no, I'm all chilled out now. I'm just easy going. And people around them, right in their immediate area, will say, oh yeah, you're easygoing. And the main reason they say that is out of fear. They fear that person and their reaction to telling them that no, they're not easy, they're high maintenance. So they don't. If they're away from that person, they might roll their eyes, they might look at you like, yeah, they're really a you know, highly reactive individual. Uh, but the fear that that person has instilled make sure that they don't say anything just to keep them calm. Now, we do find most often, again, not in all cases, but most often, easy babies tend to be the first babies that are born. Um, we think that this is an evolutionary thing because uh, you don't go back for more once that difficult baby happens. 
So I can give you an example. I have two children uh, that were born. And of those two children, first child, easy child, hardly ever cried, could take her everywhere. It wasn't a whole lot of work. And I thought, I got this. I can do this. Let's have us a football team. And I was ready for it. Um, and, and then <laughs> my son came along. <laughs> now, um, my son is high reactive, difficult baby. High reactive, difficult adult. Now, he, he swears he's laid back, he's easygoing, but he's not. When uh, I'm talking to my daughter and he walks in the door, my daughter will actually stop talking. I will stop talking because we know the minute he walks in, I need to attend to him. I need to figure out what it is he needs, he wants, how, what his mood is, so that we can gear the rest of our discussion based off of him and his highly reactive, difficult stance, temperament, on life. Um, when he needs something, he needs it now. He can't wait 24 hours, 48 hours. It's now. And he'll even say, oh, don't worry about it. I can wait. And then you get another text. You get another phone call. You, and by the time I get it to him, if it's longer than he had anticipated, he's all ticked off. So that's the difference between children. Now, there's tons of children that go in between there somewhere. They're on that range between high and low reactive. They're on the range between easy and difficult. But we tend to end having children with our difficult, highly reactive one. When it comes, we're done. Humans just can't do it any longer. Okay? So we also tend to find out that the difficult, highly reactive children are also the babies in the family. Now again, that does not mean everyone. So don't write me a letter. Don't shoot me an email saying you hate me because I'm wrong. Because if you're even thinking about that, I'm not wrong, but for some, it doesn't always happen this way. This is just the most typical thing. <clears throat> Next thing is, um, what I had done uh, a few years ago was go through these slides, take stuff out that I didn't need anymore, and I took something out that I actually did need, and that is um, a test question. Uh, remember that it's normal for an eight-month-old child to fear strangers and prefer people similar to themselves, genetic preference to themselves, like people closer to them, around them, family members, that kind of thing. Um, so remember that's going to be on a test at some point. When we look at brain development for infants, when they're in the womb, uh, there's tons of neurons that are growing. So let's take a look at the first picture I have here. At birth, this is how many neurons are uh, in an infant's head at that moment. When we move just three months forward, look at that exuberant growth of neurons. Exuberant meaning massive, fast uh, growth of neurons. Then look at it again, and we're going to look at 15 months old and how many neurons are in there. So during those first few months of life, boy, are we really just building massive quantities of neurons. When we looked at those neurons, um, many wanted to look at how can we build more neurons for children. So of course they did tests with um, other animals first. And um, so here's an example of rats. Now in the first picture on the left, we have a rat in what they called an impoverished environment. It got food, just basic food. It got water, uh, no play activities, no other rats to play with, that kind of thing. So you could see what kind of brain cell they had going on there. Now, when we look over at the enriched environment, they had a variety of foods. Uh, they had uh, play structures to do to build those neurons, and they had others to play with, which was called the enriched environment. And then look how much their brain cell just was massively bigger. Now, they find the same thing with humans, of course, because we are animals. Now, we in the United States took this just a little too far, like we do so many things. Uh, and what we did was started to think that an enriched environment was the most expensive, biggest gift that we could find for a child. It had to be very colorful. It had to blow whistles, pop weasels, whatever. <clears throat> the problem with it is an enriched environment doesn't have to cost you a penny. 
An enriched environment is playing with your parents, playing with family members, grandparents, friends, play dates, whatever you want to call it. It's interacting with other animals is enriched environment. Don't need to purchase a thing. And the big thing that we've found, and if you already have children, you already know this, you'll buy them the biggest, best, most expensive gift for Christmas. They'll open that thing up, take it out of the box, and will they play with the gift or will they play with the box? And the answer is they'll play with the box. The box is an enriched environment. Uh, get in the box, get on the box, get under the box, get next to the box, color on the box, make a fort out of the box. Do whatever you want with that box, but doing that with the box is the enriched environment, not necessarily that expensive gift that you got them. So you could go to your local IGA, Kroger, Meyer, whatever, ask them on the day that they get their boxes, if you could have some boxes, by God, wrap them up for Christmas, and you have a massively best Christmas ever and you don't even have to buy the expensive gifts. Now, a couple of terms you need to know, uh, main one being sequence. Sequence means that you're going in the same order. So sequence and order essentially mean the same thing. Now, for stage development, to list, they believe that your psychological, emotional learning goes in the same sequence as well. It started with our biological growth, so the biological aspect, such as sitting unsupported, then crawling, then beginning to walk, then walking independently, then running, etc., are all things that happen in the same sequence. Many times we'll hear parents say, you know, they didn't even walk, they went right to running, or they didn't even crawl, they went right to walking, and they did. It can be a very short time but they do go through the same sequence uh, for each and every one of our types of development and in particular our motor development. When we look at memory we have something called infantile amnesia around the age of three to four years old everything prior to that gets wiped out it's like a clean slate you don't need to remember how to live in amniotic fluid. You don't need to remember how you learn to walk. Um, it's now becoming a process. Process memory stays there. But episodic memory or things that happen in your life go away. Now, there are a few episodic memories <clears throat> that will stay. And that will be anything that saves your life or that your brain feels saves your life. So there may be people that you just know are bad and you'll stay away from them. Or there may be uh, a negative incident that you'll remember. But those positive inc incidences prior to three years old, you just won't remember. They take you to Disney, you won't remember going to Disney. Now, why is it that you think you might remember? Because of pictures, because of other people talking about it. We can implant those memories so that you believe that they are your own and they're not. Now when we look at learning skills, um, those procedural memories, uh, just like this baby learning that the little string attached to his foot, if you move that, then the mobile will move. So that is a procedural memory. Um, procedural memories that you might think of more often as an adult would be riding your bike. You know how they tell you that once you've learned how to ride a bike, you could not ride a bike for 20 years, but be able to get on it and start riding one again? That's because it's a procedural memory. And procedural memories, once embedded, stick around. Now, when we talk about Piaget, Piaget is a big proponent of cognitive development. And in fact, that's what he did his research on. And that's what he did his stages on. So the first thing that we need to understand is what is cognitive development? Cognitive is anything to do with your thinking. It's anything to do with how you remember, your memory, the way you communicate, how you function, how your body functions. Actually, your cognition, cognitive development, is everything about who you are. So there's a long list underneath of there of all the aspects of cognition, and there are even more. Now, the other thing that you need to know about this slide is that you need to either write a note, uh, normally I'd say dog ear it. Yeah, you could dog ear it in your little packet. <clears throat> but not only are these things in this list and definition important for this test, that will cover chapters one through four. It will also be important in the next test that will cover chapters five through eight. So you're going to have questions pertaining to this slide twice. Okay, so remember that. Come back to it again. 
Now here's Piaget. He's a Swiss psychologist and he always thought of children as little scientists, that they were always exploring their world, that they used all of their senses to try and figure out that world, to build that cognition, to build that understanding. And he really liked to observe and interact with them and learn everything he could about children. Now, many people will call children little adults, and they aren't little adults because they are unable to think like adults. One of the first things that Piaget came up with to understand was what he called size errors. Now, he found with children that they don't understand size the way adults do. So, for example, I got a ha couple of pictures here. This little girl on the left has a slide, a little blue slide that she slid down. Now, there's a video that's attached in this module that you can watch her as well. And when she slides down it, you'll look at her face like, well, that wasn't very fun kind of thing because she didn't understand it. The little boy on the right, he's trying to get in that little car. He works very hard for a very long time to try and get in that car. And he doesn't understand why he can't fit in it and that's because of size. There'll be a third video that will be on yours. I couldn't find the picture to go with it, but the third video is a little boy who ha is having a book read to him, and he's going to sit down on a chair, and my goodness, it's got to be painful. Now, you'll see him fall off that chair after a while, and then it'll end, but the, actually, he gets right back on that chair, and he balances himself on it for quite an extended period of time. So here's one of the stages that I really, really want you to know thoroughly. And that's Piaget's stages of cognitive development. When we go through the other people's stages of development, it'll be called something different. So remember that Piaget is cognitive development. Now, when we look at the cognitive development, we have birth to two years or zero to two. It is called sensory motor. That means you learn by your senses and motor skills during that time period. Everything goes in your mouth. Everything has to be smelled. Everything has to be viewed, heard, that kind of thing. You're learning also by your reflexes. You're also learning by movements. So that's sensory motor skills, sensory motor development, and that's how you learn cognitively. A couple of things that happened during this time period. Remember the slide that I said I needed to put this little thing on there because I forgot to? Uh, that's stranger anxiety. It is normal for a child or uh, around eight months old to have stranger anxiety. When you get up into three, four years old, it is no longer normal to have stranger anxiety, and that is something that nurturantly we've actually caused. Object permanence is another thing that happens zero to two years old. Object permanence would be as if you have any object, let's say a pen, and you had a piece of paper. You take that pen, show it to the child, put that pen underneath of the piece of paper, and the child will automatically think that it's just disappeared. They have no clue that it's underneath of that paper. When they figure out that they can lift that paper up because the object remains there instead of just disappearing, that's when they've obtained object permanence. Okay. Now there are two stages of object permanence. So after you put that pen underneath of a sheet of paper, they lift the paper up, they know that pen is there. You're going to pick that pen up again and put it underneath of a second object or second sheet of paper. And there are some that will lose that train of thought right then. And then later, as they progress through age and mature, they'll recognize that it can be hidden twice and not just disappear uh, once or twice or however many times in a row you do that. So that's object permanence. Two to about six or seven age is called pre-operational. Pre-operational is all about um, learning with words. You know those books where you open the book and it's got a picture of a truck with truck, the word truck underneath of it. it has a picture of a turtle with the word turtle underneath of it. That's the pre-operational stage. You learn through language. You learn through words during this time period. This is also a big time period for pretend play. Put your underwear on the outside of your clothes. Put a towel around your neck and all of a sudden you're super hand, Superman or Superwoman or whatever. Egocentrism is not like teenage egocentrism. Egocentrism, egocentrism means that they are unable to learn um, 
what to do with other individuals unless you reflect it back upon them. So don't hit Sally unless you want Sally to hit you. So they understand based off of their own view of being hit. Okay. 7 to 11 years old, concrete operational. That means you learn by concrete objects. It has to be something you can grasp, uh, hold on to. That's why you used base 10 blocks in math. That's why they used DNA molecules you could snap together. That's why when they talked about a bird, they might bring in a feather. Anything like that is concrete operational. Two sort of phenomena that happened during this time, uh, mathematical transformations. When they transform numbers, when they're understanding and putting apples together with a number, uh, those kind of things are coming together. Conservation is conservation of liquids, conservation of number, and we're going to go over that in the next couple slides. Then we have the last stage development, which is formal operational, and that's when you can have abstract thinking. It is 12 plus, so 12 through the end of life. Um, this is when you can weigh pros and cons and still know that even though there's 100 pros, one con can weigh more than 100 pros. So formal operational, abstract thinking, abstract logic, and now you can have more moral reasoning and understanding of the world. Now, later on, Piaget's daughter, I believe it was, came up with post-formal operational thought. Post-formal operational thought would be 18 plus. Now, the problem with it is, is that not everybody can achieve post-formal uh, operational thought. It's not um, just a stage of development that is guaranteed. So the only ones they really need to know are these four right here. Now, here's an example of sensory motor development in that 0 to 2 stage. An example of 2 to 6 to 7, and then that pre-operational thought process, pretend play kind of thing. And then here's our conservation. We have a conservation of task or object. It's liquid, actually. So here's an example in the picture. Again, you can click on the YouTube video that I have on here. Um, in the PowerPoints where it doesn't have the lecture, or you can just look in the module, and then there's videos to go along with it, and this video is there as well. Now, with this video, it shows this where there's two glasses have the exact same amount of liquid in them. Pour one while they're watching into a taller glass. They think the taller glass has more liquid. Even though you didn't add any liquid, take away any liquid, the same liquid was put in there. So that's conservation. That is something also like object permanence that you grow out of as maturity happens. Now the same thing happens with numbers, and I also have a video on that. So here is the liquid again, and here's the number. So a big thing that you're going to find when you have children, you better make it look as if they're getting the exact same amount no matter what. So if you give 10 M&Ms to one child and 10 M&Ms to the other, you can count them out. But that actually means nothing. You have to have them cover the same space. So if you drop 10 and 10 M&Ms and they covered a wider space than when you drop the 10 M&Ms for the other child and it covers a smaller space, the child will automatically think that you have a favorite child because one got a bigger or more M&Ms. Just like the picture, notice how those little mice are separated on the top compared to the bottom. They will automatically think the ones that are separated have more mice rather than the ability to count them out, or even, if they can count, to count them out and recognize that they are the same. Autism always comes up during this age span of that 2 to 6 to 7 because even to this day, it tends to be when most autism is recognized. We have found that autism can be found as young or recognized as young as 3 months old. But it still tends to happen when they're going to school, preschool, daycare, um, when they're interacting with other children most often. That's when they tend to find 
and see that there are differences. Now, there's three main things that this book goes over for autism spectrum disorder and the three general areas of difficulties. One is mutual interaction, correct social interaction. Um, we find that these children don't interact the same as other children do. Sometimes they don't interact as well. Sometimes there are more, they just want to be alone and not even talk to others or recognize that others even exist. Sometimes they socially interact too much and too close. You know, that social bubble, they break that. Um, language and plain symbolically tend to not happen uh, the way it typically does for other children and then ability to have a flexibility in their routine also tends to be a problem if it's supposed to be taco tuesday you better have tacos on tuesday because that flexibility is something at issue so in school systems a lot of times we'll have difficulty maybe the gym teacher called in sick so they come in and they say no gym today well students are upset about that they're saddened or whatever but the student with autism or on that spectrum will have a bigger problem. They better have gym and somebody better get them uh, some kind of activity to count for gym. Now, when we look at um, anyone on a spectrum as well, mirroring behaviors of others, those mirror neurons don't tend to work as well. We call it mind blindness. So they don't see facial expressions as well or register them to understand them. They don't understand when you're feeling uncomfortable because that bubble around you has been broken. So the mirror neurons uh, have some more difficulties as well. Here's an example of concrete operational thought. And then we go into Erickson. When we look at Erickson's stages of psychosocial development, just like Piaget had cognitive development, this is going to be psychosocial development. This is still, even though it brings in a lot of nurture and aspects and understanding of it, this is still a stage developmental theorist, which means he is still a genetic theorist as well. So his first stage, 0 to 1, it's actually 0 to about 18 months old, is called trust versus mistrust. Now, Erickson called them crises. Either you um, go through it positively and develop trust, or you go through the crises and you develop mistrust. Each and every one of his stages has the verses, which means you either obtain one or the other. Now, the other thing is that once you've gone through them, we can also go back and bounce back and forth into some of these uh, stages as well. So 0 to 18 months, we have trust versus mistrust. First, um, if a child knows that you will be there for them, then they will develop trust. So that means even when uh, later on you have bad relationship after bad relationship and you don't trust other people, you still have the ability to trust because you had trust for, for your parents, for your caregivers. We have to exclude abuse and neglect, of course, tends to push us into the mistrust. The other thing that pushes us into mistrust is well-guided tendencies. So it used to be let a child cry it out and you just keep putting them in bed and let them cry until they supposedly learned to self-soothe. Infants cannot self-soothe. So what they learned was that you would never come to get them, that you are never going to be them. You cannot be dependable or trustworthy. So they stop crying because they learn nobody cares. And I mean, is that really something we want to teach our children? Are there times you're going to have to let that child cry it out because you are exhausted and are fearful of hurting that child? Absolutely. A few times is a whole lot different than every single day of their life while they're growing up. Now, of all the stages of development that we have difficulty with and sometimes cannot fix, most often cannot fix, is trust versus mistrust. Once that's embedded, then we've got an issue for a lifespan. Otherwise, we tend to think as the of the rest of them as fixable, as long as you come to get help. Next one, we have toddlerhood, one to three years old. It's all called autonomy versus shame and doubt. Now, in autonomy versus shame and doubt, uh, toddlers, it's, we call it the me-do stage because that's something toddlers will do. They'll say, me-do, me-do. You want to get dressed? Let me help you dress you. No, me-do. And they'll put, you know, <laughs> their pants on their head, their underwear on the outside, shoes on the wrong feet. Uh, nothing matches. Everything is just totally out of whack. <clears throat> 
and they're proud of that. That's the me do stage. They develop autonomy based off of caregivers allowing them to do things for themselves and not telling them that they suck at it. So you can't tell them when they walk out, we're not going out like that. You look ridiculous. Trust me, take them to Walmart. They'll be the best dressed individuals there. Otherwise, pick your battles. If it's church, is it really that important? Does every other parent that's in that church remember that stage and understand it? Absolutely. So really pick your battles on this. Same thing with feeding themselves. They're messy. They're trying to get that spoon, fork, whatever in their mouth there. It's in their ears, up their nose, in their hair, on the floor. But it is that they're going to get enough to feed themselves. Many parents will say, well, they'll die if they don't get fed. If they get tired of it, they'll put that spoon or fork down, pick it up with their hand and shove it in. They will be fine. The point is that they can't develop that. They can't learn that they themselves can do things unless you give them that ability to learn on their own. Otherwise, for a lifetime, they have shame and doubt, where they doubt their abilities. They're worried about trying something new. Even as adults, you'll find that when there's something new out there uh, that they could do, they're like, no, I, I won't try it because I'm afraid to. I won't um, be a part of that basketball team because I never really learned how to do it. I never really learned how to do something, so they won't even try it. And they're very fearful. They're embarrassed by their inability. And so they have doubt about their abilities. They have to overcome this. It's a difficult thing to overcome. But overcoming it is trying it anyway, enjoying it, even though you suck at it. Because eventually you won't suck at it, just like the person you're playing with or doing that activity with. Okay? Next one we have is the preschool years. That's three to six years old. We have initiative versus guilt. This is going to be preschool, kindergarten, first grade. Now, this is where we switch from our caregivers into other people messing with our kids. So initiative versus guilt. When you walk into a preschool, kindergarten, first grade classroom and you ask a question to that class, you should have every single child in that class with not only one hand up but both hands up, their butt probably out of the seat, waving their arms back and forth going, call on me, call on me, call on me. That's initiative. You should even, when you call on them, they give you the wrong answer, they'll put their hands back up, be waving back and forth to try again because it doesn't matter. They'll give you 100 wrong answers. Eventually, a good one will come. That's because autonomy has been built, remember? Try, try again. So initiative versus guilt, though, is when you have typically an adult in that classroom atmosphere uh, tell them that not only they're wrong, but embarrass them to such an extent that they feel guilty about their response. So now they will slink down in their chair. Now, teenagers slinking into the back of the room doesn't want to answer questions. That's perfectly normal. But kindergarten, preschool, first grade slinking down in their chair not wanting to be called on is not. So that's when they've obtained guilt. And they really have a hard time uh, going to be an independent person when they're terrified to uh, be guilt and they feel guilty about everything that they do. Next one, we have competence versus inferiority. It's 6 to about 12 years. I know it says puberty, but it's about 12 years old, 6 to 12. So competence versus inferiority. This is when you feel competent at doing something. You find something you're good at. We actually find something we're good at in elementary school. And so there's four main groups. It started out as three main groups that children found competence in. They could either be really good at academics. All their stuff gets put on the refrigerator. They have all the little stickers across the reading thing with how many books they've read. They excel at academics. And as long as they excel at it, feel they're good at it, then they're competent at something and they develop good self-esteem. Another one that they could be good at is sports. And they, as long as they excel at that, they've met competence. Or the artsy-fartsy stuff. So one, two, and three, academics, sports, and artsy-fartsy. Now, you could be good at all three, and that's fabulous. But as long as you're good at one, that's truly all that matters. Because your friend base is also built off of the thing that you're competent at. You will find that the sports kids hang with sports kids. The artsy-fartsies hang with artsy-fartsies. The academics hang with academics. Uh, that's because your friend group tends to begin with what you're good at because you enjoy doing it so you continue doing it and the more you do it the more you do it with others that enjoy doing it as well now <clears throat> if you didn't meet one of those three then we had a large group of children that fell into inferiority 
an inferiority just is a child that feels they suck at everything they can't do anything right <clears throat> and that's just a really sad place for a child to be lack of self-esteem lifelong issues come from this so they had to find things that these children could do now even though you know psychologists psychiatrists uh, educators everywhere were trying to find something that these children that couldn't find competence in the other three things could be good at um, the one actually sort of fell in their hands it was outside of the school system it was uh, happened by accident and they could be good at this and not good at anything else and it made them very superior in their belief system or competence about themselves and that was gaming gaming was a big deal it fell into the hands of kids who weren't great academically didn't do sports well weren't artsy fartsy or at the top of that list and they went home and they could kick your ass online and when they did they could walk back in and they could you know tell the captain of the basketball team yeah I kicked your butt and that made them competent that gaming group picked up a huge huge quantity of students now we still have about two to three percent of students that don't fit into any of the four groups now and we still need to find something for them to excel at so they do not feel inferior for eternity next one we have is adolescence that's your teenage years about 12 to 20 years old it's called identity versus role diffusion they have confusion either one will work um, it, it's originally called role diffusion and the main reason it's called role diffusion is because what we recognize and wording that we recognize that lets us know that you're still in that stage so let's start with the identity portion first identity is who am I now there's tons of roles to figure that out it's not an easy question who am I as a member of my family who am I as a as a significant other who am I in my friendship group who am I politically who am I religiously who am I there's all different areas of our life that you have to find out who you are teenagers whole identity is about finding out who they are themselves separate from everybody else and they're capable of defining that okay now when they're not able to figure that out or they're just beginning into this it's called role diffusion or role confusion now role diffusion is really well understood by one word a teenager says on a regular basis the more they say it the more you know and that they're still in diffusion when they start stopping saying this word then you know their maturity has also helped them to develop who they are that one word is the word whatever usually cocked to the head a little attitude in there as well whatever the more you hear whatever the more diffusion the teenager is the less whatever you hear the more they're figuring out who they are as a person once it's gone they've figured it out <clears throat> now can they come back later on in life you decided that politically you were one way and now you want to go the other way absolutely but you had to get to this point to be able to make those higher level thinkings later on next one we have is young adult 2 to 40 um, mainly they think 2 to 30s or so but we're extending that now to 2 to 40s because we're extending the time it takes before we get married and those changes have extended this age span so it's called intimacy versus isolation the big thing during this time span is finding a significant other not a friend a significant other we are terrified of dying alone we are terrified of you know that biological clock that's ticking for both parties at times we do find intimacy is more significant for women and tends to be a bigger portion of their lives now what we also know is that isolation that fear of never finding someone to love you or to be loved by you is such a large thing that we will actually get in relationships that are bad because we're terrified of being alone men and women both um, and then you have to try and correct that later on that intimacy versus isolation not only can get you into bad relationships but it can um, cause us to be defensive so maybe you're not in a relationship and and people say oh I'm worried about my studies now I'm not worried about that I'm not worried about I don't need a man or I don't need a woman or that kind of thing <clears throat> 
the more you say it, the more you have problems with it. And that's the honest to God truth. So the more defensive you are about it, the more you are actually very concerned about that issue. And people that have a significant other can plainly state, well, it's not that important. I'd be fine without them because they have one. They don't know if they'd be fine without them unless that person's actually gone. Okay. Next one, middle adulthood, 40 to 60 years old, generativity versus stagnation. This is when we look back at our lives. If, you know, you're in college, you're going to get a cool job, you want to get paid real well, all that good kind of stuff. Uh, so did your parents. So did anyone between the ages of 40 to 60 years old. <coughs> And then we look at our lives when we get to that 40 to 60, and we look back and did we achieve what we thought we were going to achieve? Each and every person in their teens and 20s sort of has an idea of what they want to be when they're older, what they want their life to be, how many children they want, if they want to be married, uh, what kind of lifestyle they want to live in, what kind of income level they're going to have. They might not know exact, but they do have a picture of what they want. And there are even those that have exacts. They know they want a boy and a girl, and they can be very exact about it. Now is the time span when you look back and say, well, did I achieve those things? So you going to school right now, I bet you you're not going for a, a no good, low pain, horrible job. Neither were anyone 40 to 60 years old, but I bet you you can know somebody that hates their job. It's awful. They don't want anything to do with it. So... The generativity aspect goes in a couple of things. When we look back at our lives and we did achieve everything that we wanted to achieve, we've met generativity, we're happy with ourselves, things are good. Um, now, we can also look at our lives and say, all right, that job sucks. I'm not going to do it anymore. They put in their notice while they are uh, looking for other jobs, still finishing out their two weeks. They do things like an adult. So they do it the right way. Then they're still making generativity. They're still meeting it because they're still being a contributing member of society, the world, and what they thought they were going to be. When they meet stagnation, stagnation is when they give up. Oh, there's nothing I could do. I'm never going to find another job, so I'll just stay here. I'll stay in this marriage because, you know, it's been 50 years, so what am I going to do about it? Find somebody else? I'll just stay here and, and, and hate each other for the rest of our lives. When they give up, that stagnation. The other thing that stagnation is when they go through a midlife crisis. Now, I'm sure you've heard of that. A midlife crisis does not actually exist. It is an excuse for adults to behave badly when they're in stagnation. It does not exist. So they might use the kids' college fund or spend all their money on that pink Corvette. Yep, that's the thing I always have in mind. I can't wait till my midlife crises excuse to come. <clears throat> so the stagnation, they do something that doesn't work. They quit the job. They're never going to work again. They walk away from it. They don't have a job to, to get to or to pay the bills. They're just not doing it. Um, in the divorce, they use the kids against each other. They hate each other. They try to destroy each other. Any of those things are the stagnation portion of generativity versus stagnation. Then we have the last stage of Eric Erickson, and that is 60s till death. That's integrity versus despair. Now this is looking back at the moral aspects of your life. So when you look at your morals and your integrity, did you meet those things? Now an example of this, you go into an old folks home, you know the people that come to you and they tell you all the wonderful things and they want to talk about their history and yeah, they went through the Great Depression, but it was such a learning experience. Those are people that have met integrity. You can go into another room and they're going to throw their food at you, tell you they hate you, don't want anything to do with you. They've met with despair. They don't actually hate you, they hate themselves and just want to die. They have not met the moral integrities that they feel are important to themselves. Now we see a couple of areas in particular um, that people 60 up have told us on a regular basis happen. A uh, loss of a child can come into play. So even though that they've uh, dealt with that the best that they can throughout their life, when we get to 60 plus, we find loss of a child can lead them to despair. 
and also uh, war vets, those that have killed somebody else, even though they did it in the line of duty, they did it for their country, they had moral reasons as to why they did it. They find that at 60 plus, those reasonings that they gave themselves never were truly justify what's been done. And then they just want to die. They, they can't seem to forgive themselves to move forward. The less they want to talk about whatever has happened in the past, the more we know that that thing tends to be a huge issue as well. Vygotsky is a gentleman who is a nurture-based theorist, continuity theorist. So what we're looking at is somebody who thinks it's all about your surroundings that make you who you are. You're a blank slate when you're born. There's no stages to go through, anything like that. Now, Vygotsky's big deal was called the zone of proximal development, meaning there were different zones around you, your immediate family, your extended family, school, different levels of that school, activities outside of that. All of those different people that you interact with, all all of those different uh, societies, communities, and whatnot that you interact with make you who you are. Now, of course, that's true along with our stage theorists as well, but it's a combination of both of those things together. And he had thought it was just this nurturant based. Vygotsky also thought that everything was based off of your social communication with each other, and he called that scaffolding. So scaffolding means that you're actually sort of mentoring each other. So for example, let's say one of your parents taught you how to do pancakes and they teach you how much to put in a pancake mix and water and how to flip it over. And they might even do hand over hand to flip it over. That's all scaffolding in the teaching process uh, so that you can understand what to do on your own later on. And that was a big portion of Vygotsky's understanding of child development. Now, when we look at emotional bonds that are formed, mainly we are looking at what is called attachment. Now, the attachment is built from infancy to their caregivers, typically parents, and between them. Now, know that most children are securely attached. We tend to estimate or look at about 80% uh, that are attached. The other 20% are insecurely attached. This is when we're looking at that trust versus mistrust stage. They've been neglected, they've been abused, they've had parents that um, maybe high levels of bipolar, lots of mood swings, never know if you're getting hugged or beaten that day. Uh, there's all sorts of stuff that can come into it. Inconsistencies where uh, inconsistent parents can be one of the most devastating things that are out there. Um, so we have to really look at uh, what was that interaction that occurred that can make an insecure attachment happen. Now when we look at those emotional ties, we've done studies of course with animals and then with adults. And one of the studies that was done quite a while ago was done on monkeys. And they thought at first that it was whoever fed the infant developed the attachment. Um, and that's not actually correct. So the beginnings of this was they had the wire uh, mother, supposedly. They had the um, soft-covered mother. The wire mother always fed the animal. So they'd go to get food, but their attachment, their love, where they got their uh, snuggles and whatnot always came from the soft one. Now this one comes from uh, an understanding that with children now, if you have a baby, they're going to tell you to do skin-to-skin -skin contact as much as possible. The more skin-to-skin -skin contact, the more uh, emotional connection and bonding will take place, whether it's mother or father. So skin-to-skin -skin contact. This is actually what has come from the studies that were done on rats, monkeys, and all sorts of other different animals around them. Now, the more securely attached a child is to a parent, the more they will actually explore their surroundings, the more they'll head off. So I get parents all the time, they take their kid to preschool, and as soon as they walk in the door, the kid looks around, takes off, starts playing, and forgets their parent even exists. And the parents bawling their eyes out like, oh my God, the kid doesn't even care if I'm here. Uh, actually, that parent's done a good job. That parent has, that kid is so confident that the parent will be there when they need to, that they don't need to know that they're there. On the other hand, when you have a child that's clinging to a parent's leg and afraid 
to go out there. There's many things that could have gone wrong. Was it a parent that depended on the child too much? Is there situations at home where they're afraid something's going to happen while they're gone? What is it that's going on that won't allow them to explore their surroundings the way they should naturally a um, big thing that came up was fathers. So for many years, fathers just walked away because they thought they were unimportant, and they're not. Fathers are just as important as mothers. Their parenting skills are completely different. They do a whole different spectrum of, of activities and things with their children that their children also need. So, for example, when it comes to uh, just carrying a child, picking up a child, uh, mothers tend to always head on the top, bottom, down, and carries it the same sort of way on their hip kind of thing. Men can pick a child up by an arm, a leg, the back of their shirt, upside down. It doesn't matter. They're perfectly fine with that. Mothers will freak out, say you're going to break the kid, not going to break the kid. That is what fathers are for. We find that 80% of the time with mothers, the child is in upright position, head on top, bottom down. 80% of the time with fathers, they're in a horizontal position. Um, that means they've got them on their feet, bouncing them around, they're tossing them in the air. There's all sorts of things that they're doing with them that is more activity-based. So we also find that children with fathers are more active, more actively involved, do more activity-based uh, things. We also have found that even though you think your mom was the one that was worried about academics and, and worked on it a lot, dad is typically the one that gets ticked off when the academic performance isn't met and will follow through on whatever repercussions there may be for that. So we find higher academics uh, for most families that have a father figure involved. Now again, does that mean, uh, some of you are going to say, I'm from a single mother or a single father. I was a single mother. Both of my children were raised all by me. What I've done to them was all my fault, except for the genetic part. So um, I had to learn to do both. I had to learn to be, you know, the sweet one and also the buck stops here person. I had to be the human jungle gym and get in the water and muss my hair up, but also be the one that said it's time to eat and you have to eat your damn vegetables. So there's all sorts of things that encompass that. If you had a parent that could take the, both roles on, that's great. But that's what we found is that there's two roles. And can a single parent actually totally take on both sides of it? And the answer is no. Children without fathers, boys don't recognize how to treat significant others or partners. They don't know how to interact with them as well or what's required of them. Girls always tend to have those daddy issues when there's not a father figure or the father figure wasn't appropriate or wasn't what was needed. So there are issues when fathers walk away and they are huge issues. Okay. Another thing that came up quite often was uh, some studies that said that if you put a child in daycare, that that child will become more aggressive. Okay. Now this came during a time period when they wanted to keep women in the home, didn't want them working, wanted to put them back after the war. And so they came out and said, just started saying this. Well, then they did the studies and the research to find out if this was actually true. And they found out it's not true. What is influencing violence is actually the child's original temperament, the parent's sensitivity, how much the parent cares or not cares or is involved in it, and the economic and educational level of the family. The higher the economic and educational level of the family, the lower the level of violence. Deprivation of attachment. Um, some of you may be saying, all right, well, I was abused as a child. I went through hell, and I'm fine. First of all, remember that term relative. Fine is relative. You're telling me you have wonderful relationships. You're telling me that everybody thinks you're just great. You know, are you really? On top of that, if you are and you bounced back and you did spectacular, you are what we call resilient. Every child has a level of resilience within them. That's their ability to bounce back. 
but not every child has enough resilience to make it through. So I always hear this coulda, shoulda, woulda stuff from people, and a big thing is, well, if I can do it, you can do it. And that's quite honestly bullshit. It's not that way at all. Each and every human being has different intellectual levels, different emotional levels and understanding, different cognitive levels of understanding, different sociocultural levels of understanding, different economic levels. All of those things, even the slightest of differences, makes your resilience to bounce back different. So if your resilience doesn't bounce back the way it should, you'll have difficulty forming relationships, trust issues, <clears throat> anxiety, depression, uh, intelligence levels drop by 20 points, if not more. We see more aggression, lower frustration levels, more time being ticked off and upset at the world. Next one we have is parenting styles. There are three main parenting styles, authoritarian, permissive, and authoritative. Authoritarian, I want you to think of like the Aryan nation, bad, not good, too hard. These ones expect obedience, spare the rod, spoil the child, beat that child into submission. Um, they do it because I said so, that kind of thing. Um, these children are going to have issues, which we'll go over in the next slide. On the opposite side of that, we had a lot of parents that were authoritarian, which created a whole bunch of parents that became permissive. Permissive parents don't set rules. They don't expect correct behaviors from their children. They think their children aren't intelligent enough to do correct behaviors. So they don't enforce rules and are overly lenient. So for example, you go into a restaurant and at a table, there's a three-year-old, a one-year-old, and an infant, and they're all sitting there perfectly quietly waiting for their food, um, not wreaking havoc. <clears throat> that's probably an authoritarian parent that has punished their child into fear because that's not correct behavior for those age spans. On the other hand, you go into a restaurant, not only are these children not sitting at their table, they're running around the restaurant, eating food off of other people's tables, throwing shit around, all of those things. And their parents are like in La La Land, don't have a clue that their kids are doing that. If you go to talk to that parent and say, oh my, your child is running around, they've ruined our dinner or anything like that, they will blame you. You're the problem, not their children. Not going to change that. Okay. Now the correct behavior that we should be doing as a parent is the last one, and that's authoritative. It's just right. It is having standards. It's saying no. It's setting limits, but it's also listening. It's also discussing. It's also cooperating. It's respecting that child, and then they respect you back. Issues that come out of the wrong parenting skills. Authoritarian parents produce children that are rebellious but never seem to get caught at it. Never seem. They're the one that'll bonk you in the back of the head and look like they've never done a thing. Why? They've gotten sneakier. Authoritarian, authoritarian parents produce sneaky children. They also have compulsivity issues, which means um, they become obsessive compulsive. They need things more. Identity issues, they can't make decisions for themselves at all. So, for example, I know of a family that uh, the father was very authoritarian and the mother uh, couldn't even go, he was authoritarian with her too, by the way. Um, so that one of the children, when he was an adult, wanted to marry somebody. He didn't ask her father for permission. He asked his father for permission. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. Permissive, uh, the too soft. What we tend to see if we have parents that don't say no, the children don't know where that line is. And every child and teenager needs that line that says you can't go past this. So we do tend to see them in legal trouble so that they can find that line. We do tend to see a lot of drug use abuse. Uh, they tend to be more disorganized and more unemployment issues with these children as adults. Authoritative tend to internalize the rules, understand discipline, why they follow those rules, and what they need to do. Now, mind you, some people believe that authoritative, authoritative parents produce children that will just follow directions at all times. That's incorrect. These children have produced enough thinking process in why they do what they do. They will also retaliate against things that they believe are thoroughly wrong because of the way they've been taught. Now, when we go into adolescence, it's your teenage years, the term used most often with it is puberty, which is the physical process of sexual maturation, the ability to reproduce. 
when we look at puberty, there are different aspects to it. You have primary and secondary sex characteristics. Primary characteristics are the ones that directly relate with reproduction. Everything else is secondary sex characteristics. Now again, there's that term sequence. Sequence is the order and timing of that physical stages of puberty, and they always happen in the same sequence. You can go through some faster, others slower, but it happens in the same sequence. We also find that there are effects because of that sequence that happen. There's early maturing boys, early maturing girls, late maturing boys, late maturing girls, and the normal that are in between there. So when we look at early maturing boys, that's actually the best thing that can happen to a boy. They tend to be better coordinated, more muscle tone, they're taller. Uh, so they will be looked at as sports oriented and really schools are still based off of sports and that's the most important aspect of it. So they'll become more sports oriented, they are more confident, so they will become more popular. The smaller boy or the late developing boy tends to become the joker in the family, the, the comic in school. They're the ones that are locked in a locker. Sometimes they're picked on, given swirlies, all that good kind of stuff. But what we find with late maturing boys that we tend to see, late maturing boys make the most money when they become adults. So they'll be the one that comes back to your class reunion and they fly in on a helicopter or some shit like that. <clears throat> Now, when it comes to early uh, maturing and late maturing girls, the best th thing that can happen for females is late maturing. They can do better at sports for longer when they're late maturing, when their hips haven't widened and breasts haven't developed. Um, the early maturing girl is the most detrimental thing that could happen for puberty. Early maturing girls get called names, uh, usually has to do with whore, slut, that kind of thing, even though they might not have ever haven't had sex. It doesn't matter. It's a, it tends to be a jealousy issue. Uh, they tend to hate that person just because of their maturity level, uh, their puberty level at that time. We find that early maturing females have the highest use of drug abuse and substance use abuse disorder where they have the highest level of domestic violence perpetrated against them they have a highest level of suicide rates they have the and completion by the way not just doing it but completing it they have the highest rate of cutting or self-harm they have the highest rate of every negative aspect that you could find because we find also that that early maturing adult the torment, uh, the loss of self-esteem that happened when they were young doesn't seem to get better as they get older. Now another reason why early maturing boys also tend to um, have more confidence has to do with this. These two individuals are the exact same age. And so for that exact same age, notice how much taller the girl is. Girls mature faster than boys. And so girls would be, you know, a good head above the boys. So if there was a boy in the class who had early matured and they could look them in the eyes, what we find is that those young girls go towards boys that are as equal height and eye level or above. Here's a wide variation of maturity levels from the later maturing boy on the end to the early maturing boy on the opposite side, early maturing girl to late maturing girl. Here's our sequence of puberty on average of when they happen from 9 to 13 and a half for girls on that physical aspects, not just emotional aspects, physical ones, uh, 10 to 16 for the boys. Now, when we talk about girls maturing faster than boys, it's also done intellectually and psychologically as well, emotionally. So what do I mean by this? Boys do stupid shit is what I mean by this. So when we look at boys, we will find that their level of cognition or understanding is just different than females. So I used this slide because I actually had this happen at my house. Now, uh, at my house, I tended to have children that belonged to other people that came to my house and then just lived there and never left. And so my first young man that uh, this had happened to, he came to babysit my children. Um, and I'd say he was, I don't know, ninth grade, maybe just beginning the ninth grade. And um, he stayed with us until after, until he went into the armed services. So anyway, one day he was in his room. 
he had about four or five friends in there with him and I noticed it was awfully quiet and quiet means trouble when it comes to teenage boys there's no doubt about that so I went down to the room found that they had gone out the window now when they went out the window I went outside to look to see where the hell they were and what they were doing they had watched ridiculousness okay now they watched ridiculousness in that jackass show quite often and then all of a sudden you know even though there's big signs on it that say do not do this uh, this is not safe for you to do boys look at it and think I could do that they just did it wrong look I could see what they did wrong and they even you know develop in their mind what they're gonna do right so he had built a skateboard thing off the side of the house now I'm surrounded on three sides by woods and it was going right into the woods and it was coming off the peak of the garage <laughs> they had their skateboards and they were all up there except for one boy who was lookout for me and that didn't work out obviously so when I went out there, I had to get them down. I had to explain to them that they were going to kill themselves, that this was a bad idea. It was quite the discussion with them saying, no, no, we got this, you know, the whole thing. So finally, even though he came into the house to be our babysitter of my children, uh, my daughter, who's the oldest, was 10 at the time. And so the rules then began that the 10-year-old had to give permission for either boy in the household to do anything because if she thought it was a bad idea it was a bad idea moral reasoning comes next there are three stages to moral reasoning we have pre-conventional morality up to about the age of nine I want you to think of that donk donk sound that happens on law and order because that's exactly what it is follow the rules because if you don't you're gonna get in trouble if you do follow the rules you might get a treat so it's rewards it's punishment that make up pre-conventional morality Conventional morality has, begins in early adolescence, and it's follow the rules just because it makes everybody get along better. Nobody fights because of it, so just do it because it's the right thing to do. Now, a lot of people get stuck in this. Those are the ones that just follow the rules, do the red tape, everything like that, and don't fight against the tyrannies of society. They're stuck in conventional morality. They can be highly intelligent. They could be CEOs, they could be business people, but until you fight against things that you know are wrong, you're stuck in conventional morality. When we move into post-conventional, it's later adolescence into adulthood, if you even achieve it, and that is that sometimes the rules that you learned and that you did do now need to be broken because they're wrong. There's a better, there's a higher principle at stand here. There's something that you need to do to change the world, and that's when you hit post-conventional. Again, not everyone gets there. When we do try to teach moral actions or character development, we have to teach empathy. Empathy is not sympathy or feeling bad for others. Empathy is the ability to put yourself in their shoes and then understand from their perspective. Empathy is difficult for many people. Self-discipline, delaying gratification is when you wait to eat that chocolate cake even though you really, really want it right now. Uh, so there's delaying gratification and then volunteering helping others any all of those things together develop moral action and develop morality for children and teenagers now it is perfectly normal to have conflicts between teenagers and parents that is normal what is also normal is that they uh, are more in tune with their peers, their friends. They depend on them more. They talk to them more. All of those things are perfectly normal, and it helps them to establish who they are. Once we move from the teenage years, we go into emerging adulthood. Remember, that's about that if we were looking at Erickson 20 to 40 age span, and we're looking more in the 20s area. So one of the big things about emerging adulthood is a lot of things that we do is based off what we call a social clock, meaning our society expects it by a certain time period. So one of the big things that are out there that is expected by a certain time period tends to be marriage. Now, now, both men and women are marrying later but women are much more significantly altering that number than men are so it used to be you know the average age that women got married was 18 then it was 20 then it was 22 now we're moving up to 25 to 27 now why is that number changing so much well it used to be women just got married 
directly out of high school. Then it was, all right, you can, you know, get an associate kind of degree. And then it was a four-year degree. And then it became, I don't just want a degree. I want a degree with some experience. And the reason that social clock has changed so much is that women that went into a marriage right off the bat um, had no fallback. So if they were divorced, if some, if their significant other divorced them, they had no experience, they had no qualifications, they had nothing to fall back on. And women, it happened at such a high rate, women sort of threw their hands up and went, whoa, wait a minute, maybe I should be providing a little safety net for myself. So then they'd go to school, <clears throat> and now they had some qualifications, but yet they still didn't use them for a while. They would still get married thinking that degree would be there waiting for them, um, take care of children, didn't go out and get that job. And then they found out later on that uh, employers were looking for experience too. Yeah, you got the degree, but you've been raising kids for 18 years. Have you done anything with it? Um, have you, you know, updated on this? What do you know? What kind of experience goes with it? And so women decided to alter it again and say, all right, now I'll get that degree, but then I'm going to get some experience to go along with it as well. So it's really altered that marriage timeline for women. And what we find is that the men timeline for marriage uh, and the reason it's moving is mainly because of the women's timeline being altered so significantly. When we look at physical development, know that you are at your highest capacity, at the best you will ever be in your late teens and 20s, period. It's all downhill from there. So you will also not only be at your best physical, your bet, uh, best emotional, you have the highest level of self-confidence, self-esteem, all sorts of stuff happen in our late teens and our 20s. Typically, they happen when you move out of your home and you start to live on your own. And that's when that peak tends to happen. Now, physical peaks. Your physical peak is in your 20s, mid-20s. And you are the, your body works the best it's ever going to work. Now, I always get asked, well, you know, I know of people that were heavy set and had horrible um, physicalities about them, but when they turn 60, all of a sudden they've got, you know, the best muscles they've ever had, that kind of thing. Um, yes, that can happen, but you will work harder than you ever have or ever needed to the older you get. So it's more difficult as we progress through the years. Otherwise, in your mid-20s, muscular strength, cardiac, that's your heart, uh, reaction time, sensory sensitivity, all of those things are at their peak. <clears throat> when we look at adulthood, uh, physical development, cognitive development, social development, all of those things are declining. All of them are declining. So the main thing that we teach people is if you don't use it, you're going to lose it. That's why you see older people walking on a regular basis to keep that physical as much as possible, doing Sudoku puzzles or crossword puzzles, keeping that mental or cognitive aspect of it. Um, and again, the social sometimes isn't their choice, but many of their friends will die as they progress through age. When we look at the physical aspects, the first thing to go is your visual acuity. Um, that means you're going to need bifocals. In fact, we actually know that everyone needs bifocals at the age of 40, but <laughs> if many refuse to get them. I am included in that pile. I need bifocals. I've needed bifocals for a while. I wear contacts. Um, to a, an extreme extent, and then I have reader glasses to put on top of it. Um, I just look at, and many people in middle age to later age, look at some of these things as, ah, oh, that means I'm old, and I refuse to wear them if that means I'm old. So because that's in my mind, I won't fix that and have that corrected. Uh, hearing especially is going to be a problem. You start to lose your hearing at the age of 18. It's the higher pitches, so you don't even recognize it. But as you progress through age, the older you get, the more you lose. And then if throughout your life you've been worked in a situation where you're hearing lots of loud noises on a regular basis, like um, 
a lawn mowing, cutting grass in a factory, anything like that, then you're going to lose it faster and it's going to be more pitches and frequencies that you're going to lose. <clears throat> we tend to know people need a hearing aid on average about 57 to 62 years old. And do they get them? The answer is no, of course not. Reaction time and general motor abilities, you slow down. That's why the turtle's there. Slow drivers on the road, they're, even sto they're either stoned or they're old, one or the other. That reaction time becomes something that is far more difficult. And you'll notice it. You can really notice it when your parents or you yourself getting out of a chair and you start making those funny noises like, ugh, kind of thing. Um, you also know that your reaction time is going to be slower if that's taking place. And then we look at the cognitive aspect, a neural processing speed, complex tasks. Um, those become more difficult where this is the way I've always done it. So this is the way it's got to be because new thought processes and complex thoughts going in there are far more difficult as we progress through age. Now, of course, remember in uh, the middle age aspect, there is no midlife crisis. That's when they're reevaluating whether they have generativity or stagnation. But there is no such thing as a midlife crisis. Yet we have 25% of adults that do this. Now, I always have been waiting, like I said, for my midlife crisis so I can buy myself a pink Corvette and not pay any of my bills. But... That's not the smart way to do it. That's not the logical way. And it is not actually a psychological crisis that they're going through. Late adulthood, um, a l sometimes it has the steep decline in physical aspects or cognitive aspects. And you can see that it happens relatively quickly. And then we know that the aging process has stepped up its pace. Um, and caused a greater decline. We do see uh, that frontal lobe, that personality and whatnot, can have aging issues along with it. And we can see personality changes happening during that time period. There's that activity theory of aging. Keep doing it in order to continue to be able to do it. We do have a lifespan of 122 years, but we in the United States don't make it that far. Um, when we look at that list there in the United States, it says 75. We are now down to 72 on average. So why is it that we see other countries, developed countries uh, other than the United States, all have higher lifespans than we do? Even underdeveloped countries have higher lifespans than we do. So why is it that we don't have this higher lifespan that we should for a highly developed country considered one of the best in the world? Uh, the main thing is actually insurance. We don't have the capabilities and people don't have the capabilities to get the care that they need. We don't provide that care. We have one of the highest death rates of infants as well because we don't provide that care. Um, it's not free. It's not out there for everybody. And therefore, only those that have it do better. And that is the main reason. It's got nothing to do with our eating. It's got nothing to do with how much drugs or alcohol we take in. It has got to do with the care we use for our people. And what we find with our elderly is that, you know, they've had 401k stolen. They don't get the pension that they need. Our Social Security is ridiculous. Um, they can't live off of that, let alone be able. If your Social Security is $331 a month, yep, that's an actual amount for Social Security. Um, for somebody who's worked all their life, <clears throat> $331 a month. And your prescription, only one out of an average of eight prescriptions for older adults, um, costs more than that. You're not getting anything. And so we can see that that's going to cause quicker death rates, of course. Now, also, when we look at um, death rates, women tend to last longer than men. It's on average five years that they last longer than men do, by the way. So a, a positive thing about getting older is that, yep, there's all these things going wrong. There's all these things going bad. 
But there's something that happens with the brain that makes older people feel more in control, feel more competent, and stabilize their mood. If you haven't already gotten a lot of the um, mood disorders or schizophrenia, not going to happen now. Um, and whatever issues you have, as long as you have people around you and people to assist, then we find that they have a more positive outlook on life than they ever did, actually. Uh, one of the big things that older people are well known for are, of course, socially inappropriate remarks. And again, I'm not, I can't wait till that happens. I think it's already begun. So you say things that come to your mind and you don't even think about it. It's as if you said them when a two-year-old. You never know what they're going to say. You never know what an older adult's going to say either. We do know that generations are coming together better now than they ever have in the past. It started with what we now call classic rock, um, where you would go to a rock concert and it'd be grandma and grandpa with the parents, with the grandchildren, all together enjoying a concert together. And by doing that, it has actually made the generations more understanding of each other than they ever have been in the past. Now, outside of rock, that's happening in all sorts of genres so you could see it at a country concert you can see it uh, at rap concerts all sorts of genres are having that take place which is actually wonderful for our society so we can get those generations to understand each other again we look at it through the biological psychological and sociocultural perspective and you can look at the aging process under each one of them and some examples of each one when it comes to death and dying, um, terminal decline is when your mental abilities, as you're closer to death, all of a sudden decline at a hugely rapid rate. Many have seen this not just with the cognitive aspect, but with the physical aspect as well, that all of a sudden they start to get real skinny in a short amount of time. We see that as a terminal decline, which means that death is approaching. Now, when we talk about death, we have to bring in Kubler-Ross. Kubler-Ross came up with five stages of death and dying. Here are Kubler-Ross's five stages of death and dying. Denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. Now, I've been asked, do you have to go through them in order? Do you bounce around in them? What we generally look at is that it may go in order first, but then you'll bounce around. You'll go from denial to anger to acceptance, back to denial, back to being all ticked off, back to depression, and you'll bounce all over the place. I've also been asked, how long does this process last? This process lasts as long as you need it to last, uh, actually, and what is best for you so your and also how close that person is is it about you yourself potentially dying is it about a close family member friend the further away the the shortened time period you'll be bouncing through it so it can be for some people that they've they've gained acceptance they're sticking in acceptance for quite a while and then all of a sudden they're out of it and they're into denial or they're into anger again <clears throat> so no, I can't give you a timeline on it. That timeline is all yours.